Hey there. Um, welcome to the program this afternoon. Um, we're going to get started in a couple minutes here. Um, I'm just going to get make sure the stream is working and the recording is all set up before we um, introduce our speaker. So just hang out for a couple minutes and we will be getting started in a couple minutes. Um, if the internet does not cooperate with us uh, for the entire day uh, here, it, 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 in the past it has uh, stopped in the middle of a program and then it starts up another one. So uh, bear with us, it shouldn't be you know, gone forever. It, it, it may just temporarily shut off. So there might be uh, a couple of different recordings and we will try to consolidate those and put those up later as one big video if you're watching this uh, long after the fact. But for those of you watching live, um, just kind of hang out and we will be getting started in about four or five minutes here. All right.
I must say, not between the Ho-Chunk and the state of Wisconsin, but actually between the Ho-Chunk and the Bureau of Indian Affairs in Washington. There was a, so it, it took a special act of Congress that, that Senator Baldwin pushed through in 2014 for the Ho-Chunk to receive 1,500 acres of this property. Uh, then that's how the Sauk Prairie Recreation Area, which was larger when it was first laid out in, in 2010, that's what we have now. 3,400 acres is in the Sauk Prairie Recreation Area, the DNR, and the Ho-Chunk called it. I'm not even going to try and pronounce that, uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to translate it for you. It is sacred earth in Ho-Chunk. Uh, I remember the ceremony, the turnover ceremony in 2014, and the Ho-Chunk were very proud to announce that this was the first time that the United States Army had turned over a piece of property to in, an indigenous people that it had taken the land from many years ago. So that's where we are, and uh, let me move on here. And are we working? Come on. I thought I'm hitting the right one. No? No? I shouldn't point it there. Where should I point it? There? Up? Well, you know, it worked. It was working. We did test all this. Oh, well. All right, okay, should I try that? No, and I have four buttons to press here. <laughs> and let's try, no. Oh, wait a minute. No, no that's the cursor. Let me try some glasses, maybe that one. <laughs> unmute the microphone earlier, and so when I unmuted the microphone, I clicked on the next. Now it should work. Ah, there we are. Okay. We got it. The, <laughs> the black and white, the black and white map is, of course, it's from 1942. Location of the Badger Ordnance Works, uh, that's at 10,500 acres. As you can see, it's south of Baraboo in Devil's Lake State Park west of the Wisconsin River, north of Prairie de Sac. That's what it was in 1942. And the color map tells you this is what we have today, the division between the Ho-Chunk. And the green is the DNR recreation area. And the other part is the USDA forage, forage area, which is experimental farming. Uh, there's some beautiful cattle there, I can tell you that. So that's what we, that's what we were and what we are now. And I always like to start by telling people, what did Badger make? Badger, as I said, was an ordnance works. It made propellant. It was called a powder plant, but it made propellant, that, an explosive that detonated in the barrel of a gun. Whether it's a, whether it's a sidearm or a little, there is a propellant that, that explodes. Badger made a, and this is what Badger made during World War II. And, and in, for Korea as well, principally artillery propellant, the stuff that went into big shells. Uh, basically, it was uh, um, nitrogen-based chemicals, explosives, that, that were mixed in with a binder, I guess you could call it. First, it was gun cotton. Cotton kind of lint like we carry around in our pockets, but also wood pulp, in fact, principally wood pulp. Uh, it was processed and as, again, as propellant for artillery shells. The, the leading one was that the one in the center, there was a 155 millimeter uh, howitzer and Badger made more propellant for that particular gun than any other. Towards the end of World War II, the, the, you'll notice that uh, the rockets on that truck, that is actually a Russian truck so from the Soviet Army. The Soviets really perfected the use of small rockets 
in infantry combat in World War II. The United States was slow to catch up. And at the end of World War II, another whole facility was built at Badger just to produce propellant for those rockets. Really didn't do much in, in World War II, but in Korea and Vietnam, certainly. So that was, that's the product that, ba that Badger made for, for World War II and for Korea. Jump, oops, sorry. Jumping ahead to the Vietnam War, this is when Badger really swung into full production, full capacity. Um, in the early 1960s, the United States switched its prime infantry firearm from the venerable M1 rifle to the M16, which is an automatic rifle. And it burned, it, it required a propellant that was called ball powder. It's the closest thing to a powder that Badger actually ever made. It was small granules, not really the dusty kind of stuff. And it went in, it, it, it propelled the bullets out of that M16. If there was a signature weapon of, of the Vietnam War, it would be that rifle. It was very controversial because at first the ammo wasn't right and it jammed up and cost quite a few lives. But it was Badger and the one other plant in the United States that made that ammo, refined it and it worked out okay. And basically the descendants of that gun is still, that's still what the United States military uses today. The other thing that happened in the, in the early 60s, late 50s, was that the helicopter gunship, the use of, of, of helicopters in combat came into use. That would be the other signature weapon of the Vietnam War, and they're firing rockets. The propellant for those rockets came in the form of, of they call them rocket sticks or rocket motors. It was a, a solid propellant, all fused together, about 30 inches, so about as thick as the thick end of a baseball bat, only not tapered. And it was the fuel that propelled the rocket along. Whether it was fired from a helicopter, as you see here, or from a small plane, or, or any, any, even from land, of course. And of course, Badger, we don't think of Vietnam as an artillery war, but it was a big war for big guns. And Badger produced propellant for, again, that 155 millimeter howitzer and other big cannon. And that's what the propellant looked like. It is little cylinders. It's not powder. Little cylinders, oh, some of them aren't much bigger than a pencil eraser. Some of them are like a cigar, as thick as your thumb. Depends on what they're for. And that's what Badger produced. And for Vietnam, more than any other war, uh, Badger made a significant contribution in, uh, for World War II in Korea, but it is for Vietnam. In fact, someone has said that were it not for the Badger, Orden, Badger Army ammo plant operating between 1965 and 1975, the Vietnam War could not have been fought. Well, I don't know about that, but Let's go back here to how it all started. How it all started. Now, most of us, when we, when we think of World War II and when it began, most Americans say, well, it's Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941. And of course, that is when the United States did enter the war. But of course, as we know in Europe, the war started in September of 1939 when German Nazi forces invaded Poland. In East Asia, it started even earlier, in 1931, when the Japanese forces invaded northern China, Manchuria, and then accelerated in 1937, when the Japanese forces invaded what is, main, what is the main part of China. So there was war was going on in the late 1930s, plenty of things for defense people in the United States to be worried about. And so they decided that they were going to be prepared. They were concerned that what happened to the United States in World War I, we got into the war, but we weren't ready for it. 
And a small group of people in the department, well, it was the War Department at the time, and in the Franklin Roosevelt administration, said, what can we do to be prepared for the next one? Well, one thing they did was they set up an office in, in, in Wilmington, Delaware. And that was the explosive city, I guess you'd, you'd call it. It was the home, was the home of DuPont, the largest, the largest uh, manufacturer of ammunition in the world, and its daughter companies, the Hercules Powder Company and Atlas. They were spun off from DuPont when the trust busters broke up the DuPont monopoly. So the Department of Defense, I, I won't, they didn't do it clandestinely, but let us say they did it discreetly. They wanted to talk to the people who they know they were going to be working with if they were going to rearm the United States. And they met quietly with these people because there was a strong, strong pacifist anti-war movement in the United States. The America First movement, Charles Lindbergh and others, who were opposed to any type of, you know, of the United States participation in the wars that were already going on. Nevertheless, the War Department met with the arms people, also met with the railroads. The two people, one knew how to make ammunition, the other one knew where maybe would be the places to locate these plants. They decided that they would need a lot of them, dozens of them, and they would need them, for, well, they need dozens of them just in case something went, went wrong at one, not to mention that they needed it, they thought they would need a lot of ammo. And they were also concerned, after particularly watching what the German Air Force had done in Europe, they did not want any of these plants near the border. So essentially the Mississippi River Valley became the great manufacturing center for, for ammunition during World War II. <clears throat> there was, as announced here, there was a Badger Ordinance, there was a Gopher Ordinance, there was, it's like a Big Ten, it's like the Big Ten, there was Hawkeye in Iowa, there was sunflower in Kansas, corn husker in Nebraska. There was an Indiana ordinance works. Uh, Illinois had a huge plant, 40,000 acres uh, near Joliet on, on outside of Chicago. All the way down the river, there was a Kentucky ordinance works, a volunteer in Tennessee. There was an Alabama ordinance works. And they skipped Arkansas and they went to Louisiana. So all of these plants were established to build and make ammunition for the coming war. Um, Badger was not the first, but one of the first to be actually announced. You can see the date on that announcement, $65 million is gonna be spent on a powder plant in Wisconsin, and in the, in the date of that is October 29, 1941. Now, we know that, as I said, the, these plants were all going to be located in the Midwest, but why on the Sauk Prairie? Well, as the War Department determined, of course, and this would be true of any industrial establishment at the time, if you were going to build a factory of any size, you had to have rail lines. Uh, the type of highway transportation and truck transportation that we had nowadays wasn't possible in them in those days. And so if you wanted to bring raw materials in, you wanted to ship product out, you had to have railroads. Well, the Sauk Prairie had two railroads. The two biggest railroads in Wisconsin, the Chicago Northwestern and the Milwaukee Road also were within a few miles of the prairie. You needed a lot of water. It was a chemical plant. Well, the, on the photo on the right there, and up, that's the Prairie de Sac Dam. And behind it is the 11,000 acres of what we call Lake Wisconsin. Um, Badger needed water and electricity, and this spot, of course, supplied them both. To give you an idea of how much water was necessary, they built a four-foot four foot diameter water main, four miles, from Lake Wisconsin to the Badger, to the Badger uh, uh, plant, 
And it was big enough, the whole water system was big enough at the time they announced that it was big enough to supply the city of Madison. Now Madison had 67,000 people in 1940. So that was just the water, one water system built for Badger. They also needed good soil and that, of course, that farmland. If it was good for farming, it was also good to build on. Uh, they didn't want wetland, they didn't want hilly, hilly land. They wanted fairly flat terrain to build a huge manufacturing plant. And then, of course, they needed people. And during World War II, finding workers to come to Badger would always be a problem. They thought they, had, they, could, they, they could solve it. And even though it, other plants were built closer to bigger cities, they decided they would build Badger on the Sauk Prairie. Now, of course, the Sauk Prairie was not uninhabited. As I said earlier, it was home to, oh, not quite 100, well, the 10,000 Five, 10,005 acres was home to almost 100 farmers, uh, farmsteads, uh, three churches, three schools, three cemeteries, a small uh, fishing resort camp on, on Lake Wisconsin. But it was principally the land was owned by farmers. And when they saw that announcement in the newspaper on October 29, 1941, that this, the powder plant is coming, they said, oh no, oh, not in our backyard, not in my farmyard. And um, they were joined by the Sauk County Board, said, no, we don't want this powder plant in our area. By the, <clears throat> excuse me, the farm community in general, the Wisconsin Farmers Union said, no, we don't want it there. The the Farm Bureau said, no, we don't want it there. Even the university said, it's not a good idea. That's good farmland. Let put, you know, build it someplace else. And other places asked for it, like Adams mm -hmm. County, where I am from, which in those days was certainly one of the least productive farm areas in Wisconsin, said, bring it up, which is only be about 20 miles north of where it was actually built. But the Army stuck to this spot. And the farmers, of course, did not just roll over. First of all, they organized, and that's why I have this photo up. This is one family, one extended family. These are the six Kinchy brothers. Um, they all farmed on the prairie, all six of them, these and their wives. And they all said, no, we're not going to sell our land to the, to the army. And they organized, and the leader of the group was the woman holding her, uh, her, uh, with her hand, a handkerchief in her hand. Her name was Emma Kinchy. She married into the, into the family. And she, she was politically active before the war, and she rallied these farmers and attempted to, con well, did contact Congress, the Senate, our, states, our United States Senator, and uh, in an attempt to block the plan. Well, the struggle continued. The Army made offers, sent it by certified mail, you know, the usual real estate purchase offer, sent them a dollar uh, to make it legit. And uniformly, the, the farmers said no. Until December 7th, 1941, the United States was in the war. And then they said, one of them famously said, we're patriots too. And if Uncle Sam wants our land, he can have it, but he's got to pay us fairly. And so the struggle, the struggle switched then to saying, fighting the plan, to saying, yes, take the land, but pay us fairly. Well, more offers came. The farmers still said, no, that's not adequate. Um, finally, on January 19, 1942, the Department of, of Justice went to the a federal court in Madison, and condemnation proceedings were initiated, eminent domain. At this point, there was the government was taking this land no matter what. Farmers had no more choice anymore. They, they received word on July 19th, and they were told that they had to be out 
by March 1st. So they reorganized again with help from led by Mrs. Kinchy. And this to what they had to do in addition to moving, moving their house, finding a farm if they were going to stay in farming, buying a farm, financing it all, moving equipment, livestock, feed if they had it, and doing all that in between July, I'm sorry, January 19 and March 1. It was a very busy February. And in addition to that, they had to hire appraisals, find a lawyer, so that they would be ready for the condemnation proceedings. Because although it's, they, they're, it sounds terrible to be condemned, there's no recourse, they're taking, they're taking the land from you, but you do have a hearing, you have proceedings. And so what, what they did, the federal people would present their appraisals for the land, and then the farmers' appraisers would come along, came along, testified as well, and gave their appraisals. And then a three-man commission decided where the who, how much they were going to get. And as it turned out, it took a while, not until 43, 44. Now some didn't get paid until 1945. On average, they received 25 percent more. Now. If you're, you've got to, to put it in the context of the time, a lot of these farms were selling for $20,000, $25,000, that was the price. So if you got, if you got 25% more, that's still real money. You know, nowadays, we'd have to think of this farmland probably in terms of millions of dollars. So they did come out. In the end, they came out okay. And they did have to sacrifice. But so were farmers all over the United States. As I said, Badgers, <clears throat> places like Badger were built in every state in the Mississippi River Valley. In Illinois, they took 40,000 acres. In uh, Minnesota, they took 12,000 acres. So um, not to mention, and I will mention it, I, let me say, that in February of 1942, FDR issued that famous executive order interning the Japanese and 400,000 acres of farmland was taken away from Japanese Americans in California alone. I don't know about the other states. And they were never compensated. So the, the sacrifice these people made, and it was a sacrifice, but they at least had the privilege of the American system, which the war was being fought over, by the way, to come out somewhat equitably. Just as a, as a footnote here, <clears throat> I mentioned that Emma and Glenn Kinchy were, you know, were the leaders of the group saying no. Well, because of the, where the, the border of, of the powder plant fell, they were the only members of this Kinchy family who didn't lose their farm. Five of the six brothers lost, lost their farms. But they didn't. Uh, still there. It's right on the border, right on the fence of, uh, of the property. Well, things started right away. Um, there was a war on. They had to get working on construction right away. As soon as the ground thawed enough in the spring of 1942, it was simultaneous construction. There was the rail lines first had to come in. The surveyors, uh, equipment, materials were shipped in. Um, concrete was being poured. All of this going on. 15 miles of fencing went up with a road, a perimeter road, and guard towers even. They were, they were concerned about security. Uh, just, I just give me, I'll just give you some numbers. And now, <clears throat> this was only for the first part of the Badger construction. Actually, we're, Two more to come later on. This is uh, for the nitrocellulose smokeless powder, basically the cannon powder production area. They laid 24 miles of railroad track. They poured enough concrete that if you had had a three by three, you know, one yard of concrete block, it would run three over 300 miles, like from here to Chicago. Uh, they laid 30 miles of steam pipe. 
because the buildings were all heated from the central power plant. 88 miles of water lines, 45 miles of sewers, 140 miles of electrical cables, nine miles of line to carry acids around, hydraulic fluid, inert gas, pressurized gas. It was a huge, huge pipe farm in addition to the, to the buildings. And this work, most of this work was done by hand. <clears throat> There's no plywood, not in 1942. Um, there's, there, it must have sounded when they were, I, I sometimes think I would have loved to have heard it. It must have sounded like bang, 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 hammers going bang, 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 men driving, driving all those nails to build all those buildings. Into the winter, they were, <clears throat> they were still building. Concrete, as I said, by the, by, the, by the hundreds of yards. One thing that was new was you notice that portable cement mixer that we just take for granted nowadays? That was brand new then. It was, there was a central plant and they carried the stuff around. At, at its peak, actually 80 years ago, in August of 19, 1942, there were 11,700 men working. They were all men, of course, in those days working to build just this part of Badger, the first 900 units, as they called it, as they called them. So there was a lot going on, and the buildings had to be laid out, which is one reason why so much land was necessary. There was a guidebook called the Table of Explosive Distances, and it, it laid out how far apart the building housing one step in the process of manufacture should be, how far apart they should be, so that if an explosion occurred, only one, build, one step in the process would be damaged, would be delayed, and they could hurriedly repair it and then move on. That's why, again, why there are, why there are so many. Because it really was, you know, an assembly line process. It's just that for safety reasons and to keep wartime production going, things were separated in that fashion. Had it had uh, a more conventional, had they tried to put all this process under one roof, it would have covered 72 acres, which is, you know, roughly a half mile by a quarter mile. Um, but instead it was spread out over, over hundreds of acres. Uh, this is a winter scene that's good for the contrast. And here's a summer scene with that power, powder power plant and three of the four main production lines. The larger buildings with the gable roofs where the, where the, was where the process started. And then things moved that away, roughly from west to east. And there were four production lines to begin with. Um, okay, then. Let's, we're going to go through, we're going to make propeller. Oh, no, first we're going to do this. Some of these specialty buildings, because it was a powder plant, because it was so dangerous, here's some special things that they had to do. First, you will notice the pipe farm up in the upper right hand corner. How much pipe or piping there was around this place between buildings. Um, Safety was of concern, and many of the buildings, especially taller ones, two-story buildings, had these escape chutes. So if the alarm sounded, you came down that chute as quickly as you could. It's, and maybe you slid down on your bottom, or maybe you ran down, but you had to get out of there fast. This was a, an ether still, which was not a very not the safest of place to work on its own. But there were a number of buildings like this with safety chutes to get people out of, out of the plant, out of the building, rather, as quickly as possible. In the lower corner on the, on, on the right there, the actual building where production is taking place, you see two little gables sticking up behind that, in, behind, behind that, that wooden wall. That's the building where the production is actually going on, and it is barricaded. There is this, this is a wooden, hollow wooden wall, about three feet wide, wooden on both sides, filled with earth. 
so that if something went wrong on the inside and there was an explosion, and there were, this did happen, it did happen, the explosion would go up and the force and flames and debris would go up rather than going sideways and endangering more people and yet another step in the operation. There were many, many barricades like that at Badger and there, because wood was less of a strategic resource, they were made of wood and earth, of course, they had plenty of earth just to dig a hole. Worms like that were all over, the barricades. Okay, now let's make, we'll see if we could, we're gonna make some smokeless propeller. It starts with a, with a like I said, a, a binder or, or a, a medium that, that contains the chemicals. Um, sometimes it was cotton. Uh, that's one reason why cotton to this day, I believe, is considered to be a strategic mineral, or a strategic material, because it is the base for building explosives, ammunition, cotton. But then again, from just before World War I on, the technology was, was perfected to use wood pulp instead. And there was a heck of a lot more wood pulp around than cotton. And actually, the bulk of what Badger made its materials out of was wood pulp. Just that I, sorry, I don't have a photo. I've got a photo of, of the cotton. So the cotton went into the shredder, and oops, and it was mixed with the first dose of chemicals in the dipping room. And the young woman over there, she was, of course, she was a dipperette, right? She couldn't be a dipper. Um, However, she did the same work as any man did, and uh, you'll notice the clothes she's wearing. It looks like you know, she's a lumberjack, but actually those are woolen clothes, and well, jeans, of course, um, and they're impregnated with fireproof material. Uh, you'll see all the clothes that these workers are wearing in these photos were impregnated with, fi with fireproof material, and they were cleaned and taken care of at the plant. When you came to work, you came in your street clothes, you changed, and you, you got into the clothes that would protect you, we, they hoped. Next step was after the, after the chemicals, the acids mixed with the binder, they went into this ringer, which whirled them around. Now, you're talking about explosive chemicals, and, all, and you're whirling them around and that's why that man is wearing all that armor. This was the most dangerous job in the plant, the one that m most injuries occurred, none fatal, thank goodness, um, and required protection. It was funny, as during World War II, as, as more women entered the workforce, uh, this was the only job that they would not hire women for. They, they was just supposedly too dangerous. Everything else they did. Uh, in fact, as you'll see in the photos that I'm going to keep using, the Army, the Army wanted to recruit more women to work at Badger, so we have a whole collection of publicity photos with women working. Um, the, it was, the, the material was compressed. They called these cheese wheels for obvious reasons. Pressed into a solid, dried, drained, cured, all moving through this system. Then, I'm going to move my sheet here, it was extruded, as they called it. It was pressed, came down into this funnel-like apparatus so that it could then go into these individual drums and then go into the thing they called the macaroni cutter. And all of those individual strands of propellant were then sliced to whatever size they needed. And there they were. Again, there's a close-up of that photo that I, that I showed you earlier. Um, then these, they were cured, measured, aged a bit, and tested. Um, it really was a precise operation because if you were giving this propellant to the army that is fighting for you, you want it to 
propel the warhead the way it's supposed to. If that artillery piece is supposed to fire a shell four miles, as many of them did, you didn't want it to fall down three miles and maybe land on your own troops. So there was testing and, and, and it was a deliberate operation. And the workers were always very proud of the fact that they, what they did always worked. They were giving American fighting people the best product they could. Now, I mentioned earlier that one of the problems with sighting Badger in a rural area, although it met all the other criteria, there was always there was a problem with workers. <clears throat> the population of rural Wisconsin was, of course, much smaller than, it, than in those days. And so what they thought they would do is build, is build housing across the road from the plant. First, first thing they built were these things called H barracks, the ones at the bottom. They were in the shape of an H, and they were for individual workers. They were kind of semi-dormitory, where there was a cafeteria in there, a rec room, and individual well, rooms for four men, usually, at a time. Um, when they were still having a problem recruiting people to come, because they needed, at peak, they needed 6,000 workers at Badger to get all of the, all of the uh, processes going. And that was World War II. Later on, they needed even more. Um, they decided that they should make housing for families so that people, workers, would come with their children and spouses, and even better, man and husband and wife would go to work at the plant. So this is what they built. They dropped those things off. They call them demountable houses. And you notice they dropped them right in the cornfield. Um, wired them up, and you could see this was the kitchen. You got a cold stove, a refrigerator, a little table, a little, a little sink, cold stove for heating, and a little gas stove for, uh, for cooking. That was family housing, and there was bedrooms on each side. Now, since families, families had children, Badger had really what we would call ideal childcare. In fact, a lot of working families would love to have this kind of childcare. It was 24-7, seven days a week, because Badger operated 24-7, seven days a week. Children went to school, to up, up to grade school. There weren't very many kids in high school. They were bused to Baraboo. But anyway, uh, they had a grade school, kindergarten, pre-kindergarten, and even what we, I guess you would call a nursery. They kept dropping the age of children that they would take care of till it came down to newborns. 24-7, they even hired a wonderful woman. They, she was just grandma. She was Grandma Isabel. And she was in her 80s. And her job was to come to the nursery for two hours in the morning, two hours in the evening, and all she did was rock babies to put them to sleep. She loved it. They loved her. Um, that's what Badger, that's what they had to do in order to have workers uh, come to Badger. They actually, by the end of the war, because they didn't know how long the war was going to last, there actually was room for 6,000 people to live there. But it was never the case. Maybe only half the, half the people lived there. To get workers to come, there was, a, there was a busing service. Hundreds of buses. They traveled as far east as Beaver Dam, as far west and south Mineral Point. Um, I don't, they didn't get to the Wausau Stevens Point, but they did get to Coloma. Toma, um, and they brought people to and fro. To and fro, you could you could travel on the bus. Um, buses were particularly in, they were particularly useful in during World War II when the employment crunch was so so tight. But buses ran also during the Korean period and also during the, the Vietnam era up until the seventies. It was very convenient. Uh, I have some friends tell me in, in that when the bus came to Adams, the, uh, the group that was getting on the bus was always, would always buy a case of beer. 
and leave it on the bus for the group that was coming home. <laughs> that was, yeah, that was a way to get along in the, in the workplace. Huh? Um, in, in 1944, well, let me back up a little bit. Badger started production after a year of construction in the beginning of 1943, producing chemicals, producing uh, the ammunition for the artillery. In 1944, I mentioned earlier that, as I mentioned earlier, rockets came into vogue in the military, and a whole other plant was built on the Badger grounds. That created a terrible labor shortage. Again, thousands of construction workers, thousands of operating workers. So what Badger did in the summer of 1944 was set up the Traveling Employment Office. Hercules Powder was the operating contractor. That's why it's Her Hercules did the hiring. This, this thing traveled around central Wisconsin, came to Oshkosh, came to Stevens Point, came to Wausau. Uh, moved around to hire people and sign people up right away because they needed workers. Um, to give you an idea of, of one, one big incentive was that if you were just a uh, common laborer, entry level laborer at Badger, you could make 82 cents an hour to start. Now you think, what? That's pennies nowadays. However, I remember interviewing one young man, or well, he wasn't young anymore, but one man who came to Badger as a young man, and he, 82 cents an hour? He thought that was just, he was on the gravy train because he had been working as a farmhand and making a dollar a day plus room and board. Now he was making, at the minimum, $58 a week. Sorry, that was men, women, even though they're necessarily doing the same work, women only made to start 66 cents an hour. And that was just the bare minimums for the, for the least, uh, you know, the least skilled labor. And you, very quickly you moved up the scale. You had overtime. Badger worked normally a 48 hour week and that those last eight hours were time and a half. If you worked on a holiday, it was double time. So there was the way for people, Badger was a big economic development program. People came out of World War II with a, and all of these operators with a lot of money, with more money in their pocket than they ever had. You could make more money working at Badger than, for example, if you were a country school teacher. If you were in any type of, of work in any of the small towns around, blue collar, you made more working at Badger. Okay, one thing that Badger didn't do, and I have to, I have to point this out, this is, 19, in the world 1940s, this is still Jim Crow America. And the Hercules people, although they were encouraged to recruit all over the country, they were cautioned not to recruit in the southern states because they did not want black people to come up and look for jobs. Because, because it was Jim Crow, even in Wisconsin, they would have to build segregated housing for them, even though there are plenty of vacancies in that Badger village. So the Badger workforce was entirely, entirely white Americans, deliberately so. There was an exception to that, but I, I can tell you that if you want, but I want to keep moving here. We're running out of time. Uh, so at the end of World War II, Badger had this brand new rocket production facility. It was barely used but it played an important role in Badger's, in Badger's future. Well, the, in Europe we know the war ended in May of, of, of 1945. It dragged on until August, until the atomic bombs were dropped on Japan. Um, Badger shut down immediately, almost like, you know, as quickly as they could, they turned off the switch. Then the question came up was what to do with this, the 10,500 acres? Um, the United States the, and Wisconsin came to an agreement where the, the Army would give the whole property to, this, to Wisconsin. And Wisconsin had plans to really build a great big health and social service facility there. And this was the time when, when people were institutionalized. So there would be a large mental health facility. 
facility for the developmentally disabled, a contagious hospital, because people with certain diseases were quarantined, a tuberculosis asylum, because those were, all, those were also quarantined, a, a facility for juvenile offenders, all that was gonna be built there. And then an army colonel looked at Badger again, and he said, you know, we've got this brand new rocket plant, rocket powder plant, that really hasn't been used, and look at what's going on in the world. We may need this. And so the, so the Army stepped back and kept the plant, kept it on standby, reactivated it for, for, the, Korean, for the Korean War, and it ran again. And then Badger became part of really what was the Cold War arsenal of the United States. You know, we think of it was the strategy, of course, was based on, on, on nuclear destruction, that we would not go to war with the Soviet Union because we were both nuclear, nuclear powers. However, there were plenty of other opportunities for wars to go to take place, and so Badger was part of that arsenal that was going to arm the United States should it go to war with the Soviet Union and not engage in nuclear warfare. So let's we go ahead now to Vietnam, and I mentioned earlier that Badger was the one-stop shop for ammunition for the Vietnam War the ball powder for the M16 rifle, the rockets for helicopters and airplanes, and of course, artillery propellant. It was the United States in the, 19, in the 1960s. Badger was activated in, in 19, beginning of 1966. The United States had already escalated the war, to use the term. Hundreds of thousands of troops were on their way to Vietnam already. The draft had, had kicked up, taking more young men. Um, and of course, there was a peace movement. And in these early days, it was not violent. <laughs> Badger began production in, in the beginning of 1966. And in June of 1966, that summer, a group of people who believed in nonviolent, nonviolent protest came and did a peace march to Badger from Madison. They had it planned. They left on, on Wednesday, walked up Highway 12, walked for the day, got in cars, went back to Madison, came back the next day, walked a few farther, walked farther until they got to the Badger plant, to the gate of the Badger plant on Saturday afternoon, where they sat down, just as peace activists did in those days. They sat down, they said, we're not going, and what we want to do is we want to get in the plant and talk to the workers, tell them what they're doing, and see if we can talk them out of making this ammo. Well, that wasn't going to happen. They could not be admitted to the plant. The sheriff of Sauk County, was uh, a man who deserves much praise. I remember I interviewed him and he said, he said, I, was, I knew what was gonna happen and I was not gonna be one of those Southern sheriffs. He was going to handle a peaceful demonstration peacefully. He lined up his deputies, and there weren't a lot of them by the way, it was still a small county in Wisconsin, so that to protect the gate but he also had to protect these, these marchers from badger workers who would have been quite happy to pounce on them. Anyway, thanks to the sheriff's, thanks to the sheriff's force, they sat down and said, you could stay here as long as you want, but you're not gonna go in the plant. So they stayed for the whole afternoon, and Mike was, you know, sheriffs are elected, so they're partially politicians. And there were some kids with the group, and so he walked around handing out deputy sheriff cards, junior deputy sheriff's cards to the kids. And somewhere around, I'd love to have one of these, there is somebody who was 
maybe 10 years old in 1966, who maybe has got that card somewhere. Um, so the marchers went, and the march ended, but, but they had achieved their goal of getting maximum media attention. It was, they timed it to be there on Saturday afternoon so they would get prime coverage in the Sunday papers, which, you know, that was, that was the, big, the big way to get your, the news out in those days. Well, time passes. Time did pass. Oops. Time did pass. And the war in Vietnam continued. The, and the protest against it became more violent. And there was that terrible year of 1968, uh, assassinations, the police riot in Chicago, and, and on and on. So in, in 1969, a young man living in Madison named Carlton Armstrong decided that the way to point out the evil of the war in Vietnam to the people right here in Wisconsin and the world was to make some kind of statement at Badger. I mean, it was the place where, all, where the arms were being, the ammunition was being made. And he thought it'd be a good idea to bomb it, to drop, to bomb the place. Well, in the so-called underground media of the day, newspapers of the day, there were plans to build, quote, fertilizer bombs. Bombs that were very similar to, actually, the same chemical process that was used at, at, at Badger. So, we, so Carlton went to a pizza joint, and he got some big jars that were used for mail. And then he also, also got a hold of, got two of those, and then he also got a, uh, I don't know if you remember, there, ashtrays on, their, on metal stands, and they were hollow, always, and he got one of those, and he got, some, got his fertilizer. You could just go to a, a you know, farm store and buy fertilizer, and poured kerosene in there. And then he had a brother, a brother named Dwight, who worked at the airport in Middleton, you know, just on, on the west side of Madison. He worked there, but he wasn't a pilot. But nevertheless, they decided that they would steal an airplane. They steal that, stole that little, a little Cessna 150 there. And it, they decided they would do it on New Year's Eve, 69, you know, December 31st, 69, January 1, 1970. They broke into the hangar, uh, pushed the airplane out. Dwight f figured how to start it, but he didn't know how to turn on the instrument lights. So they were just—they were kind of flying, really flying blind. However, I, you know, fortune favors the foolish or whatever. They got the plane in the air, and Dwight was able to fly it. But without the instruments, they couldn't see the compass. And the airport is right near the junction of Highway 12 and Highway 14. Well, 14 runs west to Spring Green and ultimately the Mississippi River. So when they got up, they started following Highway 14. And it's too bad they didn't keep going <laughs> because they found out that they were going in the wrong direction. They came around and followed Highway 12 up to the Badger plant. They, they knew once they were there, they'd have no trouble spotting it because Badger was lit up like a small city. Um, it was the brightest spot in, in, in central Wisconsin, I can assure you, especially in 1970 when there was a lot less light around in general in the countryside. Well, they weren't, it's really indiscriminate, I suppose. What they did, they enlisted the aid of a young woman who were persuadable to be their getaway driver. But they also sent her up to Sauk City and told her that when they saw, she saw the airplane coming over, she was to call the plant from a public booth. Now, I know some of us here are old enough to remember public phone booths and uh, how unreliable they were. Well, she went to one booth, and there was somebody in there. And, they weren't giving up the phone to her. She went to another one, and it didn't work. There maybe were only two in Sauk City at the time. So she went back to the other one and hoped that the person was, was gone. 
And just as this was happening, she saw the airplane fly over and try, put her dime in, you know, you can still do it for a dime in 1907, put her dime in the slot and the phone didn't work. So she was, they were hoping that she would warn the plant that the place was gonna be bombed and therefore the workers should evacuate, which was problematic in its own, but the Armstrongs thought that was a good idea. Anyway, they continued flying. They flew, got up to uh, Devil's Lake there, the hills, you can see the hills at the top, turned around, and actually would have been a, a military person would call it a perfect bombing run. They, they came right over the plant, and Carl opened the door and threw his mayonnaise jars out and the ashtray out, and they just landed in the snow, and, and nothing happened. In fact, nobody at Badger was aware that anything had happened at all. They didn't even hear the airplane. Um, they were lucky. Uh, they were able to land the airplane at the Sauk City Airport, which is just south of the plant. And they were really lucky because the airport manager said, boy, that must have been some good pilot who, who flew that plane in. Because across the north end of the airport, there was a power line. And these guys were flying in the dark. Pilots usually didn't land from that end. And they missed that line, were able to land safely, and their accomplice, well, she was, she was waiting in the bushes for them, and they got in the car and drove off to Madison and celebrated the New Year. Um, no one knew about this until, until the Armstrongs did an interview with the, with, again, one of those underground newspapers that were common at the time. And all of a sudden, whoa, what do you mean? Somebody tried to bomb us. This was, and actually, the Badger people went out and looked Oh yeah, they, there's the broken jars. They found the ashtrays. Yeah, something did happen. Well, that's you know that was you know comical and fortunate that nothing happened. Uh, however, had they crashed the plane, something serious might have happened. Those buildings were full of explosives, and if they'd hit the right one, if they'd hit the power plant with the plane, not with the bombs, something serious might have happened. Well, something serious did happen the following August when the Armstrongs, again, built a better fertilizer bomb, filled it, filled, in fact, filled up the back end of a, of a van with it, parked it in front of the, what was the Army Math Research Center in Sterling Hall in Madison and ignited. This one worked and it blew, damaged the building terribly and killed a young man named Robert Fastnet. They became fugitives and were later caught, but that's a, that's a whole other story. But what started with Badger ended up in the death of this young man, innocent young man in, in Madison. Well, there we are at the end. Badger continued to produce arms until 1975 when we withdrew from Vietnam. The plant went back on standby and remained on standby until 1998, when it was declared surplus, and then as I mentioned at the beginning, the property was, was divided up after a huge, huge cleanup. The, what's the legacy here? Well, the legacy is both good and bad. Um, Badger helped the United States defeat the Nazis and the Japanese in World War II. It helped us win the Cold War. Now, we, you know, you would say, well, Korea was a truce halfway, but if you live in South Korea today, you'd be pretty happy that, you know, that with that outcome. You could say we lost in, in Vietnam, but ultimately won the Cold War. The Soviet Union is no longer in existence. There are a lot more free people in Europe today than there were before the Soviet Union collapsed. And Badger played a role in that. Um, in the course of operations at Badger, uh, a total of 24 people died, all men, half of them in construction. Construction's a hazardous occupation. The other half in explosions. Uh, other part of the legacy is, of course, contamination. There is a plume of Ground, of contaminated groundwater moving towards the Wisconsin River, and the people who are living in 
Prairie to Sac, Sauk City are going to really confront that soon. The people are, there are people around the plant who are ready, not drinking, cannot drink water out of their wells. Um, on the other side, other side, the, um, the Ho-Chunk in particular are restoring prairie. Uh, it's really exciting to see what they're doing. They are burning on a regular basis, and it's only a matter of time when that, they will see that tall grass prairie that was there before the farmers came in the 1840s. DNR is working on making on, on their recreation area. It is open. You can all go there. You can drive through it. You can walk through it. One of the best ways to see the place is to ride on the, on the Great Sauk State Bicycle Trail, which the old rail lines that run from Sauk, run Prairie Sac through the plant. You can just, you can ride a brand new bike trail if that's, you are of that mind. So that's the story in brief. I'm sorry I was so long, so brief in of Badger. And it's certainly an American story. It's really much the history of the United States, certainly since World War II. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, please? Yes. Very, very few. Very, they are. Uh, they had to be torn down because they were contaminated. In fact, they couldn't even be recycled. There were some beautiful timbers in those buildings, but they were so impregnated, either with the propellant or or with other chemicals, ether, uh, dinitrotoluene, all a number of things that were in there. In fact, in order to safely dispose of the of the of the, of the lumber, there was the biggest chipper, I swear, I never, I'd ever seen it, the biggest this room, and they would put the telephone poles inside it and shred them all up, and beams and anything, wood, siding, anything, which all, all shredded up. And if you were there on the, and so I was told I wasn't there all the time, but while this shredder was running, grinding up all this wood, you would hear pop, 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 or sometimes a little boom, 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 because there was some explosive in the wood that when it was being shredded, would, would explode. So there is, there is a huge hazardous waste facility. It was specially made, and it is there on, on, on the Badger property because that was really the best thing to do with it, rather than ship it off somewhere. It was just to create a safe disposal facility right there on the plant. That's where the wood is, and asbestos, and a number of other things. When, when the buildings were first built, the idea was in, for World War II, the idea was, well, we only need them for five years. The war is going to be over by then. So they didn't paint them. They didn't put the, the only roofing they used was you know, roll roofing, you know, tar paper, the equivalent of. And when the Army decided to keep it, well, then they put better roofing on and siding that was loaded with asbestos. And all of that, all of those hazardous chemicals are in that landfill there. Hmm. Okay, yes? Uh, we went out this year to uh, Washington State on an expedition from here for a cruise, and there they had the nuclear plant that was, uh, it was like 60% of the nuclear material was built in that area. And when they built the facility, 30,000 people were there in one year. When it was done, that actually was basically nobody was there. Mm -hmm. That was at Hanford? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, again, that's, they took, they did something similar that at Oak Ridge in Tennessee for the nuclear, uh, for, the, for the nuclear program. Uh, and all of these others that I've mentioned, I, I'm talking, I talk about ordnance works, which were one step in the production, but there are also ammunition plants. So that, that's where Badger materials went to be loaded into shells. Wisconsin, we had Badger Ordnance, and there was also the Eau Claire Army Ammunition Plant. It was a smaller facility, but that's where they actually made the shells. It's now the Presto plant, the aluminum plant. Okay. So I'm wondering that landfill you talked about. Mm -hmm. Is there any protection underneath there to keep groundwater 
Uh, what, yeah, I'm no, yes, what I, I, I'm no expert at, but what I understand, yes, is they had to bring in a special clay liner, special, and also they're in big plastic, excuse me, they're in big plastic bags. They're a special pla plastic that, it, that, that the stuff is in, in addition to resting on that clay. And there's drainage away from it is, supposedly it was state of the art. Mm. Yes, well, because the contamination that's in, in, in the groundwater is, was there already, and whatever happened, whatever, it's not connected to the landfill at all. That's been there for years and slowly moving. Mm. Mm -hmm, sure. Oh uh, no no it covers if you add it let me add do my math no it's 7500 acres okay. okay because the way it is it's 34 3500 acres are in the uh, are in these um, recreation area another two almost 2000 are in the dairy forage and then 1500 went to the ho chunk so 7500 pretty much yeah there's a couple other landowners in there but but those are, that's the main yeah Pardon me? Oh, yes. Yes, I should mention that. I'm part of the Badger History Group. There is a, a museum there on Highway 12. It's one of the buildings that was built in, actually was built in the 1970s as the first computer facility for the place. So it wasn't involved in production and wasn't contaminated, so it didn't have to be torn down. And it's about, it's about as big as this room together here, all of it with offices. It's on the DNR property and the DNR has been very nice to our history group and lets us use the facility rent free, which is nice. Mm -hmm. This contaminated groundwater you mentioned is seeping towards the Mississippi? No, towards the Wisconsin. Oh, towards the Wisconsin. Ultimately, the Mississippi well, are they, is. There. Any big river? Yes. Is there any Well, I, I, I don't, they're working on it. That's all I can say. They have, they have a system of monitoring wells all around, and I'm, I'm really not qualified to answer. <laughs> yes. No, no. I'm sorry, it was not a print, and I keep saying to myself, oh, I should really reprint that book. I should bring it out again, but... Uh, no, I'm sorry, you'd have to, like I said, pay 40, 50, oh, somebody told me you paid $100 for it on eBay, on the Amazon, oh. Yeah, so you really have to like it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thoughts about future programs, or what it just occurred to me to ask surveys. what prompted your interest in and <laughs> ended up with the book and all of this. Well, what I actually what I, I did for a living was I wrote history books for hire, okay. and so I worked for companies, I worked for historical societies, I worked for.